Hello, I'm Paul Cowling with Film Independent and welcome to another virtual Filmmaker Tuesday. Um, before we start, as the room fills up, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. I'm gonna give you, uh, let you know what's coming up next Tuesday. We have another edition of our Spotlight Your Story. This is um, uh, where we bring together members of our artist development um, department to talk about uh, applying to our artist development programs. We did one a few months ago that was virtual here on Zoom. And this one is in person at our offices in mid Wilshire. So it's a chance to have some FaceTime and uh, you know meet them face to face and hear from them. This one is gonna be devoted to our screenwriting lab, um, which is about to open for um, submissions and also uh, to for project involved. So you'll meet people from both those teams. Uh, that's next. Tuesday, the 20th of June at 7.30 at our offices. Um, and then coming up uh, on the 11th of July is the next Indie Link. This one is for editors. This is a chance to meet 15 editors who, who will all present their reels to a room full of film independent members. And then we break for reception and uh, you can meet them all face to face. So if you're an editor looking to present, we have plenty of spots open. Uh, for you to submit your reel. Uh, we, we want a three minute reel from the editors and uh, uh, we've got, I think, uh, about a dozen spots left. Uh, so yeah, July 11th, uh, Indie Link in our offices. Uh, but tonight, it's all about uh, accounting, um, production accounts, um, not the most exciting, but a very essential part of, of filmmaking, especially if you're a producer and, of course, you have to balance the budgets. Um, we're a great proponent of hiring a payroll company uh, to handle your accounts. And uh, we've got our great friends from Greenslate here today, a payroll company, uh, to guide us through things like um, employer record and fringes and, and, and all the really sort of granular stuff that is uh, an essential part of uh, balancing the budget. So uh, joining us today is the president and COO of Greenslate, uh, Mike Lieber is here. Where are you, Mike? Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having oh. us. You're joining us from New York, right? That's right, I'm uh, dialing in from Manhattan tonight. Okay, welcome. Thanks for joining us and staying up a little uh, past the sort of uh, past the end of the workday for you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and also joining us from Green Slate is Celeste Jackson. Hey, Celeste. You're muted right now. Sorry, sir. And hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Celeste is a senior VP uh, working in client uh, relationships, right? Client relationship management. So uh, you're the, you're probably one of the people that uh, if anyone work any producers work with you, you're you're their sort of liaison at Green Slate, right? Exactly. I help you solve whatever problems or specialty services you need. So I'm here for. Great. Yeah. So we've got quite a bit of, to get through. Um, I. Before we uh, before we kick off, I, I, I want you to let people know a little bit about Green Slate and uh, some of your services, especially for some of the indie filmmakers who are listening. Absolutely. So I'll kick us off. Um, good, great to be here tonight. Really happy to be presenting to the film independent community. Um, yeah. So Green Slate, if you haven't heard of us, we are an entertainment payroll company. We're the third largest in this industry. Uh, we've been processing payroll for the last eighteen years. Um, and we really started in independent film. Um, that's really the, the core of what we've done as a company, where we started. Um, Celeste, I've been with the company for 17 years. Celeste has been with us for 18 years. And so we've really worked side by side all these years, kind of bringing something different is what we're going to get into tonight. Um, talking all about employee agency model processing and how productions can take advantage of um, a different kind of payroll processing model that's not on offer everywhere um, to unlock savings in their budgets. So that's really the core of what we're going to talk about tonight. But um, you know, Green Slate is a software and services business. Um, we're all about providing the best software and the best services to our clients. Um, and we have a long track record of doing it, um, not just in the independent film, but in features and television. Um, our clients kind of run the gamut of production. Great. 
Oh, well, I'm so pleased you're joining us. Um, I forgot to start. We were going to do a show of hands. So let's let's have a look at people tuning in. How many people are producers by a raise of hand, a virtual hand? So we can have a look here. 24, 24 producers. Great. Um, and I'm going to have you lower all your hands. How many people specifically do work in payroll or accounting? More six, seven, seven people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also curious how many people are joining us from outside of LA. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I know we had some people uh, who who registered from outside of the US. So, uh, how many people joining us from outside the US? Out of curiosity, half a dozen or so. Well, that's good. Cool. <laughs> So you've got an amazing presentation lined up for us. So I'm going to uh, get off the stage here and tune in from uh, from the wings, and I'll be back um, when we move when we go to questions. So uh, if you're tuning in, I've left the chat open so that you can exchange uh, your information. We just before you want to put in your email or just you know say hi. You're a producer or a writer, yeah. whatever you want to do. Questions for our uh, guests today should be posted in the Q and A. It's a uh, button at the bottom here, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Try and make the questions uh, as succinct as possible, and we'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, if you post your question in the chat, we won't look at those because I'm looking at the Q and A for for those. Um, someone from my team might remind you. Will if we see any questions in the chat, just let people know to remind them to post it in the Q and A. But uh, for now, I'm going to step off stage and Celeste and Mike, take it away. Oh. Thanks, Paul. So to kind of get us started, you know, the topic of this uh, presentation tonight is how to unlock savings in your production budget. It was great to see how many producers are here tonight. You know, we said this might be a little dry. We're going to try to keep it as interesting as possible. But really, our goal is to give you you know, just enough information to be dangerous, to ask the right questions, and to help you when you're putting a budget together to have a little bit more understanding about uh, what goes into budgeting fringes for a film. So the agenda that we're kind of going to run through tonight, we're going to give you some history about our company and about ourselves um, and, and what we've been doing in the independent film community. Um, we're going to go over the difference between employer of record versus agency payroll processing. Um, what are fringes, all those expenses you pay for on top of uh, the wages that you pay to employees. We're going to get into a little bit about what unemployment taxes are and why they matter uh, and show you some real life examples from budgets that we've worked on of what kind of savings you can recognize when you use an agency model um, to process payroll. That's the topics we're going to go through tonight. So, uh, you know, to get started, I think, Celeste, why don't you kick us off with um, Kind of an intro about the company and yourself. All right. Thank you, Mike. And hello, everybody. Um, so as they said, as Paul told you, I'm the SVP of client and industry relations here at Greenslate. And while we've been processing payroll for like the last 18 years, as Mike has said, um, my story starts a little bit before that. So I started out working in the trenches of independent film here in New York City and had a glorious decade working in what I think is the most amazing work environment that any of you can work in. So I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight. Thank you very much for having us. Um, when I started out, my very first position, like a lot of people, was as an office intern on an indie feature and worked my way in the trenches as a freelancer for, I don't know how many, a good dozen features until I came across a wonderful indie producer by the name of Dolly Hall, who became my mentor. And I worked with her for a number of years. Then we went and worked for a production company, sort of the same path, which I'm sure a lot of you have taken in your own careers of you, as you've gone through things. Uh, but Along the way, I worked my way up, as a lot of people do, and I, when we were at Green Street Films, I co-produced a feature called Tadpole that was directed by uh, 
Griffin Dunn, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And at the time, it was a direct, the producerial debut of Mira Sorvina. So Mira produced it with us. Uh, we took it to Sundance and had a, a wonderful time, of course, best way to do it. And we also, um, I was also the line producer on a project called, um, oh boy, I'm getting myself confused. Sorry about that. Um, but I was a tadpole was for, uh, so I was like the line producer on a, a project called Tadpole that was directed by Griffin Dunn. Uh, we also did a project called Famous uh, that we took to uh, the Uncertain Regard section at uh, Cannes that year. We did very well. And then I had a couple of kids, and so wasn't working to disappear for a couple of months, for four months at a time, to go work on a feature, and I needed to find something to do. And everybody, as you do know, when you're looking for a job, you reach out to people in the community, and they all suggested that I go to John Finn, who was an accountant in town who owned a company called JFA, where they did uh, production accounting and post-production accounting on indie features here in town. Everybody said he'll have something to do. They're always busy. So I went and talked to John to see what he had going on. And he said, well, actually, I'm thinking about starting a payroll company. So he had, working as, a, as the accountant, been studying the invoices of payroll companies and trying to figure out how, when you look at it, the payroll company was charging a payroll fee of 0.25%, a quarter of a percent. And John was like, how can a payroll company exist on a quarter of a percent of a payroll fee? So he dug a little bit deeper, looking into <clears throat> what else goes into paying for payroll, processing payroll, and trying to understand what was in the invoices, how the charges were done, and figured that there must be a way that you can do this cheaper and with more transparency so you can understand what all the different parts are that make up those features and how you can do it better and cheaper. So he also looked at as a company owner that when you set up a new company, um, you are given the new employee rate for certain taxes, which we'll get into in a little bit and you are the direct employer. So as you know, when you set up a feature, you form a new company, single purpose entity, that's going to be the one that is going to produce these, take care of all of the, uh, the production company behind what's going on. So he thought, why not do it that way? The way every other business does it in this world, where the production company becomes the direct employer, and maybe we can do it cheaper. So we created the agency model, which Mike will get into and give you the specifics of. And with that, we've been doing it for the last 18 years since we started the company. And you will see on the beautiful screen below here, some of the projects that we've done in different states. I, Tanya, we did in the state of Georgia. Coda was in Massachusetts, also won the Oscar, as you all know. Um, Rong Missy was in Hawaii. We did One Night Miami, Miami that actually shot in New Orleans and Sound of Metal, one of my favorites, that shot in the great state of Massachusetts. So we've done it for, I don't know how many hundreds of projects over the last 18 years. And it's we've saved a lot of money for a lot of clients. And Mike is going to explain exactly how we've done it. <laughs> Thanks, Celeste. So as Celeste said, you know, the agency model is a unique offering uh, that GreenSlate offers. Um, and we'll get into the mechanics of it, try to give you a little bit of knowledge about it to explain how exactly it's able to save money for, for producers. Um, so just to kind of set the stage a little bit, we'll talk about employer of record, which we refer to as EOR versus agency payroll processing. So most entertainment payroll companies that you work with are only going to offer you an employer of record payroll model. That has always been the industry standard for processing payroll. 
Um, and the key things to know about that is in an EOR model relationship, all taxes are going to be filed under the tax accounts of the employer of record, that is the payroll company entity. And when you're working in an EOR model, you are always going to pay the maximum SUI rate to the payroll company. Those are the two key things to know. The converse to that is an agency processing model. Agency processing model is where the payroll company is acting as your agent. So as Celeste said, you're setting up a single purpose entity for the production of your project. And we as the payroll company can act as your agent to file all taxes on your behalf. Um, this is how most companies uh, in the United States operate um, in an agency processing model where the payroll company is doing all tax filings on behalf of that company. Um, this is a model that we pioneered for this industry and that we've been proving out over the last 18 years for our clients. Um, that being said, we offer both an employer of record and an agency processing model. Uh, the majority of our business is actually in the employer of record model because that is um, what clients are most used to, but we're happy to offer both. And what's great about our company is we like to give our clients options. We like to look really work closely with producers to look at your budget, understand where you're shooting and help analyze with you what the right model is to help you achieve savings. Because our goal is to help you keep as much money on the screen as we can through our job. And so the difference when you're using an agency processing model um, is that this, all the taxes are gonna be filed under the tax IDs of your company, of that production entity. Um, but we try to make the service exactly the same, whether you, you choose EOR or agency, we take on all the additional work of doing tax registrations for payroll tax accounts that you need and doing all, all the filings on behalf of the production. So really, we try to make the service exactly the same in both models, but give that option to producers to help them achieve savings if it's going to fit for their budget. So now let's talk about fringes and um, how it works and when it works. So taking one step back, we want to talk about fringes. So when we talk about fringes in our business, um, we're talking about all those additional expenses on top of the wages that you have to pay to all your production workers. So they're basically break down into four categories um, of fringes. Um, number one, employer paid taxes. This is the one we're going to drill into the most tonight talking about unemployment insurance, which is the, the big variable rate that can change depending on the processing model that you choose. Um, you know, I think sometimes we think about taxes just being as what comes out of our checks. And we don't always think when you're an employer, you actually have additional liabilities that you have to pay on top of those wages um, for all your employees as well. And that's when we talk about employer taxes, that's what we're talking about. Number two is workers' compensation and disability insurance. This is a, another quite large expense um, that you have to pay when you're an employer. Every state in the US requires uh, an employer to have workers' comp insurance. And really, it's a very good protection um, for you as an employer. We all know working long hours on set, there's a lot of slip, trips, and falls, people getting hurt, caterers cutting their fingers. It happens all the time. We see all sorts of it in our business. Um, and workers' comp insurance is what keeps you off the hook um, by buying insurance. It covers all the medical expenses associated with people getting injured on set, which unfortunately can happen. Um, and so this is something that you have to have. And when you're working with a payroll company, they're providing that workers' comp insurance for you. Skipping over number three, number four, if you end up on a union project, producing a union project, signatory to union agreements, the biggest expense that you're going to have as a fringe are pension, health, and welfare benefits that are dictated by those contracts. Um, they, you know, that can be quite expensive. And um, when you're working with a payroll company, uh, it's our job to make sure that you're calculating those benefits and getting them paid and getting you charged for that and getting them paid on time so you don't run into any extra expenses. Um, and then number three was the payroll company handling fees. So why you need an entertainment payroll company is really to take care of numbers one, two, and four, make sure all your tax liabilities are paid for, make sure you have your workers' comp insurance in place and any claims that come in, any injuries that happen, everything gets handled. And if you're on a union project, make sure that all those benefits are calculated correctly and paid on time. That's really why there is this niche business of entertainment payroll is these you know, companies like ours are experts in all of these areas. 
and can take kind of all the burden and stress of handling those things off of your plate, lend you expertise, and especially have software that helps facilitate all of these items for you. So moving on, employer taxes, I mentioned earlier, um, unemployment insurance is really uh, one of the large factors in employer tax, and it's one of the variable items and what leads to kind of the creation of the agency model. Um, so quick primer on just how unemployment insurance works. Um, every state has their own unemployment program. They get to set the rules of it. They get to set the rates of it. They get to set the benefits that people can claim. Everything around it is governed at the state level. State level. So there's a lot of intricacy to it. Um, there's, you know, 50 states, a couple territories, they all have different rules for this. Um, there's two main components when you're determining as a producer what the cost is going to be that you need to look at. One is the percentage rate that's going to be charged. This varies from state to state, and it can also change from year to year. And then there's always a state wage base with a maximum amount. So that is, you will pay a certain amount on the first X dollars in a particular state. Um, how unemployment works. So when you are an employer, you have to pay unemployment tax in on all the people who are working for you. So as you're paying people out, you're gonna pay a certain percentage to the state. That money goes to the state, it gets logged into an account that's under your tax ID and it starts accumulating. Now, as you stop making your project and you lay people off, they have the ability to claim unemployment. We know all this business is highly freelance. People are constantly coming on and off of unemployment um, you know, to make up wages when they're not working full-time throughout the year. So as people claim unemployment, it goes against your account balance. So you're paying the tax in as you're employing people. And as people are unemployed and claiming benefits, it goes against you. When you register for a tax account, the state's going to assign you, for the first time, they're going to assign you what's called a new employer rate. Um, in the state of California, that rate is 3.5%. After one to two years of being an employer, the state's going to reassess your rate. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at what your account balance is. If you have a positive account balance in your tax account, they're going to reduce your rate. It can go as low as 1.5% in the state of California. If you have a negative account balance, if more people have claimed unemployment benefits against you than you've paid in in tax, they're gonna raise your rate. And in that next year, you're gonna pay a higher rate. It can go as high as 6.2%. And so let's say you're at that maximum rate. Now for the first $7,000 in wages you pay someone in a year, you're gonna pay 6.2% as opposed to that new employer rate of 3.5%. And that's really how the agency model works. It's all about the spread between the maximum rate, which is what a payroll company is going to charge you under an employer of record model, no matter what, and what the new employer rate, which is what you can get as a first time employer uh, working on a new project with a new company, you can get that lower rate. And so there are a number of states, as you can see on screen here, where there's quite a variance between the max employer of record rate and the new employer rate. So a few examples from a number of really good production locations you can see on this list, New York, Georgia, New Mexico, some of the top production markets, as well as Massachusetts, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. You can see the spread. And really, these last two columns are what it's all about. In the state of Massachusetts, and Celeste is going to share a couple of examples as well, the max employer rate is 8.62%. The new employer rate is 1.45%. This means that you can get over a 7% savings on the first $15,000 in wages you pay to each of your workers. And that savings really adds up over the course of a budget. So the SUI savings is really what the agency model is all about and what we help facilitate um, by employing an agency model. The other examples here, you can see, you know, the variance goes down as you go down the list here, but Certain states like New Mexico or North Carolina, where they have very high SUI wage caps, it may only be a variance of 5.4%, which is pretty, pretty significant, but you're going to get that variance back on the first $30,000 in wages. And so that can really um, add up significantly for you as, a, as an employer. So what we do at Greenslate is when a new client comes in, the first question we're going to ask you is, where are you shooting? Where are you working? Where are the majority of the employees um, that you hire are going to be working. 
And then we work with you to go through your budget, provide you fringe options, and help you figure out whether an agency model setup is going to work for you. If not, that's okay. There's many states where it's not as advantageous, and an employer of record model is the best choice for you. And really, we're agnostic as to which model um, clients uh, choose to go with. Um, for us, it's really cost neutral. We're going to kind of talk a little bit about price transparency. You'll see on an agency model, we actually have a higher payroll handling fee and a slightly higher workers comp charge. That's really just showing you the transparent economics of it. When you're working with an employer of record company, there's revenue being derived from not just state unemployment insurance, but payroll handling fees and workers comp as well. These are all areas where there's revenue for the payroll company. In an agency model, you're seeing the true cost of that. Um, and that's really kind of been our ethos from the beginning was to show transparent pricing to the industry. So they understood an employer of record model, it's not just about that handling fee. Um, there's other areas where there's revenue for the payroll company. And that's okay. We want everybody to kind of understand this and that's the point of what we're presenting tonight. So with that, I'll uh, hand it off to yeah. Celeste to show a couple uh, budget examples to try to bring this to life with some numbers. Excellent. Okay, so the first one is what does this mean for you and your bottom line? And the easiest way to get your wrap your head around it, because it's all very dry stuff, I understand. But if we look at, say you hire a first AC, they get paid $2,500 a week. They're going to be working for five weeks in the state of Massachusetts. Over those five weeks, they're going to make $12,500. As you saw in that previous slide, the wage cap there, the most that they're going to get charged for is up to $15,000. So all, everything that he's going to make or she's going to make, you're going to get the benefit of the spread. So if we look at this, the first three tax categories, FICA, Medicare, and FUDA, that's Social Security, Medicare, and federal unemployment taxes, those are federal taxes. So those are fixed. It doesn't matter which state you work in, how large or small your budget is, you're all going to get charged that same rate with those same wage caps. And you'll see between the column that says EOR model and the one that says agency model, the charges are the same. If you go down to the second section, that shows the three variable rates, state unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, and the payroll fee. We're looking at the state of Massachusetts, like I said, and the wage cap is $15,000. So in this line, you get uh, charged 8.62%, which is the highest rate under the EOR model for state unemployment insurance. And that you will be charged $1,077.50 on that first AC's earnings. And under the agency model, where the new employer rate in Massachusetts is just 1.45%, you're only charged $181.25. So for state unemployment insurance in the state of Massachusetts, under the agency model, the savings is going to be nearly $900 just for that section. Now, there are other pieces to it, too. You know, there's the workers' comp. And if you look at the payroll fee, as Mike explained, under an EOR model, you're charged 1.25% for payroll fees. Under the agency model, where it is our true cost, our true payroll fee at 3.5%, you're paying for 3.5%. So it's $156 versus the 437. So once you put all those pieces together under the EOR model, you're paying $2,600.75 for your first AC in taxes. And under the agency model, you're only paying $2,000.10, 75 cents. So that's an overall savings of $590. Probably doesn't sound like a lot, but think about all of the different crew members you have on a project. If you're making $600 or you're saving $600 on your first AC, all of the camera department, all of your PAs, everybody, it adds up in the overall budget. So if we look at the next screen, which is a summary of an overall budget, and gotta apologize because we tried to do like a full screen from an actual budgeting program and there's no way that anybody could read all those little teeny tiny lines. So we're giving you the summary of it with the major pieces. Um, and again, if you look at the taxes as they go across, and this is based on an overall budget and what we do and what we will do, if you want to take a look at it, what you can do yourself, 
is you go into your budget and you can change the fringe assumptions that you're using, which is just how we did it. So for the EOR, EOR model, you drop in all the EOR rates, gives you your bottom line. Agency model, same thing. And basically, if we're just looking at the tax pieces again, under the EOR model, your total payroll fringes with those tax pieces for the overall budget, $346,620. Under the agency model, $316,972. And that gives you savings here of nearly $30,000. So on your project, think of if you get an extra $30,000 that you can put on the screen rather than paying the bills, you can, you know, find another location that you want to shoot at, you know, hire a couple of extra PAs if you want to do it. You all know what the challenges are as you're counting all the pennies and trying to make it work and having that extra $30,000 can really make a difference when you're trying to deliver the movie. So, again, when does the agency model work? There are the two factors. What is the spread between the new employer rate and the maximum SUI rate? How big is it? And then how high is that wage maximum and how long do you get to take advantage of that spread? So the bigger spread you get and the higher the wage maximum that the state offers, the more savings you're gonna be able to realize. So there are um, a high number in either case that will likely create an agency model savings for the producers. They're the best states for agency models. So if you're gonna be shooting in New York, or Georgia, or New Jersey, or any of these states listed here as the best states for the agency model, you really wanna take a look at perhaps how much savings you can get out of that budget. You know, Try dropping in the rates, see what the savings is. If you're filming in one of the other states, California, Florida, Alabama, where you don't get that savings so readily, the EOR, EOR model makes sense. The employer record model makes sense. So, I think that uh, we're ready for questions if you have them, but also we would really like you to think about how this can maybe come into play with the projects that you have coming up. You've got something in one of those states where you think this might work. You know, we'd love to take a look and let you know. So we have some questions. Make sure you post your questions in the Q and A. We have we have quite a few here. Um, I'll, I'll go to them in order. Um, mm -hmm. Vivian was asking about. Well, this is yeah a little. It, it's about AB five, which is the uh, I believe the California law that that changes the definition of an independent contractor and whether an independent contractor is that or uh, is a full time employee, right? Um, yeah, they're asking that's, about that's right. that and any workarounds. So how does that affect yeah, um, hirings on, on film crews now? Yeah, so AB5 you know, was, has been a crackdown basically on independent contractor status, trying to tighten that up um, to make sure that people, only true independent contractors are hired as such. Um, right. It was things like Uber drivers that sort of that, that was kind of the uh, that, that, that triggered uh, this. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Um, we've definitely seen you know an increase in auditing, an increase um, scrutiny of producers um, who are attempting to maybe classify independent contractors who are not as such. You know, we've worked with budgets of all size. We're you know plenty aware of of the type of you know expense control that's necessary to get a project on the screen. Um, you know, our recommendation is generally, you know, to treat people as employees and to try to keep those costs down as much as possible. You're running a good amount of risk when you try to classify people as independent contractors. There's really very few positions that can really fall under that 1099 classification um, under AB5 and under the rules. Um, and so, you know, we really encourage people to, uh, to try to stay right with it as best they can and pay people as, as W-2 employees as necessary. Um, you know, the only kind of workarounds that we see are, you know, with your above the line talent, you know, you can pay people through if they have a legitimate loan out company um, where they take business expense, 
you can pay above the line talent through a 1099 company, um, which can you know defer some of these costs um, you know out of the budget, so you won't pay those taxes, um, but you will still pay workers comp and payroll fees. Um, that's really the only legitimate workaround that I would say um, that we see people employing and, and kind of uh, able to do successfully. Uh, Carver asks, do you have employees uh, familiar with the tax code in every state? Yeah, that's that's what we do. That's why the entertainment payroll companies exist. Um, you know, we're operating um, in all U.S. states, territories and in Canada as well. So we can advise on, you know, tax issues that are occurring in um, the states. And really, you know, our systems are geared for this, right? People are traveling frequently in this business, um, productions, especially post COVID are everywhere. Um, you have people who yeah. never are showing up to a set anymore. And so you have your prep team in California and your production team on the ground in Massachusetts and you're posting in New York, especially with all the tax credit incentives that are out there. Productions are everywhere. And so our systems and our people are geared towards making sure that your liabilities are covered wherever you are in the States. Do you see any correlation between um, tax incentives and, and these? Um everything you've been talking about how these vary from state to state absolutely you know people are very aggressively chasing the best tax incentive that they can find and yep. as mike pointed out on the state by state comparison some of those tax incentive states the top tax incentive states actually have very nice spreads if you want to look at them but even if they don't i mean we can make it work in california where they're trying to push the tax incentive better there you know you can see more activity there um, New York is very aggressive. New Jersey is um, doing great business. State of New Mexico, Georgia, all over the country. People are seeing the benefits that our business brings. When we bring in the work, we make it work. Yeah. Um, pay you have something to add there? Mike? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, some of the states that we highlighted in the presentation were really geared towards some of the best production markets with some of the mm -hmm. best uh, incentives. So we tried to highlight that in, in the states we were calling out where you can get this additional savings. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's, you could do a whole weekend conference on, on tax incentives oh, yeah. statewide. And it's like every year because they're changing, they change so much. Yeah, we uh, also page... have a number of experts in-house who work on tax incentives, helping to facilitate them, not just you know keeping the industry up to date on what's changing in the incentive world, but also um, kind of fee for service incentive management. Um, so helping you get through the audit faster, making sure all your records um, are, are where they need to be to pass an audit and trying to get that return for your investors as quickly as possible. Okay. That is a big focus of what we do as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of questions here about um, international productions. Um, how does the um, employer of record versus agency model choice work on international projects? And, and then there's another question about, do you provide international services, and specifically New Zealand and Canada? So we don't actually pay, we don't actually process payroll in foreign countries, but what we can do is if you're working in say the UK and you're bringing over your keys from the States, we can pay them stateside. Um, and we can, uh, you know, help you figure out the rules and sort of the tax implications, you know, of bringing people overseas. Even though is you're there an advantage to doing that? So there's real, the EOR and agency part of it doesn't really come into play as much on an international production that we do have clients who use the agency model while they're producing overseas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we work on international productions, as Celeste said, usually paying any of your U.S. talent that is traveling overseas. That's the portion of it that we handle. And we find that our clients are typically using a production services company on the ground to pay the local the local talent. So you can still use if you have a large enough crew, it could still be advantageous to pay okay. um, your U.S. workers while they're working overseas using an agency model. Um, and again, it would really just, we didn't want to look at the budget with you and try to understand how many people are traveling over and whether it's worth it, um, you know, for the, the crew size and whether there's savings there. Okay. Um, Kathy asks, uh, is the, uh, SUI cap dollar amount across all payroll or is it applied employee by employee? 
it's applied it's applied employee by employee so that wage cap is um on each individual as they're earning okay uh keith hey keith no, keith uh if your employer pays uh sui in massachusetts but you normally reside in california what happens when you're out of work would you still qualify for unemployment in california that's a good question it is a good question and california yeah. is actually a state that has a unique role uh mm -hmm. sorry, rule about this mm -hmm. uh, that they passed a number of years ago where they said California entertainment workers, wherever you are, we're going to collect SUI for California. So I remember when that was implemented, we had to change our systems. It used to follow wherever you're working, that's where SUI gets paid. But when California passed this rule, all of a sudden, California SUI applied for residents of California, wherever they are. So uh, generally speaking, if it was two different states, you'd be able to claim it um, in your home state regardless. Um, but in the case of California, all the SUI tax is getting paid to California anyway. Okay. Um, how big does your project have to be to work with GreenSlate? Do you do ultra low budget? Is there a, is there a minimum uh, threshold there, budget wise? Um, it's changed over the years. We've certainly done projects of all size and we do still work on ultra low budget productions. Um, typically, you know, we're looking at, at budgets a million dollars and up, um, but we're always willing to have a conversation or refer out to partner companies who work on smaller productions. Um, but we're always happy to have a conversation, take a look at the project and see if it's a good fit for us or for uh, another company we could recommend. Okay. Uh, another question about international, which I think we've answered already. Um, Eric says, does, uh, do the payroll company fees include workers' comp insurance? So they're typically broken out as two separate line items, the payroll fee and the workers' comp. Um, so they're generally charged on the same wage base, uh, but they're broken out as separate line items to be budgeted separately. Okay. Um, Peter says, when using the employer of record model for a union project, the payroll company is actually the, sign the signature to the union contract, as I understand it. How is that contract's expectations transferred to the production company? So I'm not sure that's a true understanding. I would say typically the producer is either directly signatory or okay. um, there are companies that operate as third party signatories that you can hire if you don't want your production company to sign up directly. Um, there are third party companies that um, for a fee will be the signatory on your behalf but it's not typically the EOR or, or payroll company um, that stands in as the signatory. That usually is the producer. Um, and that's really how they how the union bodies want it. Okay. Um, so there was another question about international productions and specific to fringe costs. Um, uh, I, I, we pretty much covered that, right? Yeah. You see that one there? Yeah, tax yeah. rate is very different country to country. And actually, some of the most complicated taxation rules are here in the United States. But um, our the way that we do it is very different than the way that people do it overseas. So the EOR and the agency model doesn't have the same understanding outside of the states. <laughs> I mean, a US production filming abroad, it's what is typical? Is it is it mostly like the, the makeup of the, the crew, is it mostly department heads who are US based and yeah. uh, above the line? Yeah, typically it's your keys and your talent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, would it be legitimate workaround if a DP or UPM is willing to work as a loan out on an ultra low budget film? If they have a legitimate loan out company, you know, we're their single purpose entity and that is their it's an actual loan out company that's been established for the benefit of that individual then yes that can work we do a lot of that okay yeah. we have a this is our last question we, okay. we had quite a few questions but if anyone has any more speak or type now or forever hold your peace ah, okay thanks Carla. <laughs> um so anonymous question could you 
specify what fringes would apply to a documentary project at the two to 300K level working with non-union crew. So yeah, what, do you want to talk about a little bit of working, shooting non-union and what fringes you have to pay, even, sure. even on a drama? Sure. I mean, I think most of the fringes that we talked about um, tonight would still apply, except, of course, the any of the union um, pieces of it. But, you know, employer paid taxes, you know, you're always going to have those federal taxes, um, yeah. Social Security, Medicare, federal unemployment tax. And then depending on the state or locality that you're working in, you'll have state unemployment insurance, as we talked about. Um, and then, you know, certain cities have additional expenses as well, but those are a little bit more rare. And then you would have your workers' comp expense um, for the payroll company to provide and uh, administer any workers' comp, um, and then the payroll handling fee. So that's really that really encompasses it. And um, you know, depending on what state you're in, that percentage can be 16%. It can be 22%. It really depends on which model you go with um, and what state you're working in. That's the biggest variable. So if you're going super low budget and you you choose not to use a payroll company. You really need a a producer or an accountant, a production accountant, right? Very familiar with all this, the the, the, yeah. the state rules and the federal rules. Yeah, I, you know what we find when people don't go with a payroll company, I, I think they're probably typically not keeping up with all their responsibilities here, and you're really just kind of running a risk as a producer. Um, you know, if you don't have your workers' comp in place and someone gets injured, that's you know potential lawsuits and issues yep. for you. Um, yeah, they told I mean, me at film school, it, don't, <laughs> even at film school, they don't skip on the workers' comp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not, not a great idea. I mean, the other big piece of, you know, what a payroll company provides, whether it's us or one of our competitors, is a general ledger accounting platform that accountants are familiar with. And that really allows you to keep track of all your expenses, all your spend. Um, and that's crucial, right? You know, you don't want people you know, running away with dollars that really should be ending up on the screen. You know, you want to make sure that everything is getting accounted for. So we absolutely encourage people to hire accountants. A big part of what we do also is referring accountants, trying to keep in touch with the accounting community, know, knowing who's available. So when clients come in with projects and they say, do you know anybody who's a good fit for a project this size? We keep a whole Rolodex of, uh, of accountants on file so that we can um, refer them out for projects. Um, it's a big part of what we do. We, we definitely don't encourage people to skimp on accounting um, or payroll because unfortunately we've seen all sorts of horror stories when people do that and I things bet. that come back to bite them. Um, so we, we also bet. come yeah. in and clean up messes for people when they make that decision, unfortunately. <laughs> you don't want to be the janitor though, right? <laughs> you want to be there from the start. Um, you know, as our payroll company, well, sometimes we are the janitor, but uh, it can, <laughs> just a part of what we do, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Carl has another question. Is the company solely based, uh, Green Slate, I think he means, uh, solely based in New York, asking for a project where we are taking advantage of a film incentive where payroll processing fees are a qualified expense? We're not solely based in New York. We are um, spread out. We're, as a company, we have employees in 26 states, but we have uh, headquarters in Burbank, um, but we did get our start in New York. That is where we were founded. Um, and our fees qualify in most of the major production states, New York um, included. So uh, we also have, yeah, we also have offices set up in some of the major tax credit states. So we have a very large office actually in um, Atlanta mm -hmm. and follow the rules there so that you can qualify as well right. as New Mexico, which is another good one. We're, yep. we're yep. big production hubs, in other words, yep. or production states. Yep. Yep. Um, Temi, hey, Temi, uh, what model do you recommend on a production that has a California state film tax credit? Well, I think it means bet between the uh, EOR and agency. Mm -hmm. Is that what he's referring yeah, to? Yeah, I mean, as you saw in California, I mean, the, the spread isn't going to last very long in California. And so EOR is typically your better model in the state of California. But yeah. um, that would be the only deciding factors, which one works better, because we can do either. <laughs> but yeah, Cal California, typically, we we really just do employer of record, if that's where the bulk of the, okay. the project is. There isn't okay. enough things to be had. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Keith has another question. Is a loan out employee slash contractor still covered by the payroll 
companies uh, or production companies workers comp insurance as long as we process in you through payroll yes you are yeah loan out employee yes an independent contractor no it has to go through the payroll company the payment has to be dispersed by them and then they will um, be able to declare it on their workers comp okay uh we'll probably take uh this last question from Paige. just a couple more comments which i'll get to but um Paige also asks if you if you're retained to pay US based key players who are traveling to a country like Ireland where there is a taxation treaty where we would still be on the hook for US fringes for those players how do you charge is it a percentage fee based on only those crew rates not in the total budget so for US people working overseas in in a country like Ireland you are still paying um U.S. fringes on those individuals, and they may be paying, they may have withholding for the local jurisdiction that they're working in um, additionally, and they're able to claim a credit on that against um, their U.S. taxes. Um, but yeah, we work closely with clients to look at the tax treaty, understand how long people are going to be working overseas um, to make the determination of the proper taxation or any additional withholding we need to do for that local place. Um, and I, what was the last part of that question? Uh, it is on, it's all kind of tied to the individual's earnings. So those fringes are across the board on the individual's earnings. Uh, it's also true that if you're shooting a low budget film um, abroad and you're working on a low budget, a SAG low budget agreement, those, um, those don't qualify in another country, right? That's the SAG rates for actors are, are the standard rates, not the, the Ultra low, the low budget or ultra low budget agreements don't qualify there. Right. Is that right? I believe um, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that is it. So, um, Carver had a, uh, asked, is there a public list of places you have offices? Is that on your website? Yeah. If you uh, visit www.gslate.com, um, you can see a list of our offices. Um, and then something else uh, we wanted to offer as part of this, you know, uh, just another link to another site um, where we can do a free budget assessment. If you log in there, there's a brief questionnaire. If you have a project that you're working on, um, you can go to info.gslate.com slash savings um, and brief questionnaire. We can try to point you in the right direction for EOR agency and uh, help you get in touch. Great. Um, and if, if people want to, reach out to you directly? What's the best way? Is there a, a, like a, a standard email address they can reach you? Uh, general like a, email address, info at gslate.com. But um, if you take our first name, dot last name, so mike.liba or celeste.jackson at gslate.com, you can get in touch with either of us directly and we'd happy to get you in touch with the right person to help you with your questions. I know, and I have to say, I mean, you know, we started out this company with our indie film roots and you know our producer friends our UPM friends were out there doing projects that started with us from the very beginning and there's nothing that makes me happier than supporting the indie film community so if you got a good project and you want us to take a look at it then reach out to us info that gslate.com slash savings and we'll let you know how we can what we can do for you yeah, Great. Celeste and I are, are true film nerds. Uh, I studied <laughs> film in college. and The my number first, nerds, right? <laughs> yeah, my first job was craft services on a Paramount production 20 years ago. And, you know, we, we love this industry. We love supporting independent film. We still get a kick out of, you know, in the early days when we did our first Darren Aronofsky mm -hmm. movie or our first Wes Anderson movie, you know, to working with Barry Jenkins on Moonlight or Chloe Zhao on Nomadland. You know, we still get a kick out of, um, you know, working with these incredible filmmakers who are trying to real put real art up on the screen um, for the for the world to see. So yeah. we're happy I mean, to support yeah. that and what we do. The work the, you these are all do. filmmakers who've come yeah. to speak to us about their craft. And it's nice yeah. that, uh, albeit a, a couple of years later, we're hearing from the people, you know, paying the bills <laughs> there yeah. on their productions. Yeah. Um, do you want to um, stop sharing, Mike? Sure for the sort of sign off here. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, what, there was a final comment here from Amber saying, thank you for this, so very helpful. Um, will you be emailing the recording? Yes, we are recording this. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, Mike and Celeste have agreed to share their deck as well. So we will um, email that to everyone that, that joined us today. We'll yeah. send you a copy of the deck. And thank you all for coming tonight. It was so much fun. I, it makes me very happy to be a part of whatever it is, the little things that y'all are doing. I'm happy to like be whatever tiny part of it we can yeah. be. Okay. And I, I am pleasantly surprised that we had, you know, about 60 people tuning in to a, a session on fringes <laughs> and payroll. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite encouraging that there are people that, that do realize that this is important stuff. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Mike. Wow. And so yeah, last, thank pleasure. you for joining us. Thank you, Paul. And this has been great. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in. This has been another Filmmaker Tuesday with Film Independent. Uh, come back soon. We, we do these once uh, a month virtually and once a month in the office. Uh, if you're not a member, you can join at filmindependent.org um, slash join. Um, but yeah, that's is me, Paul Carling, signing off. <laughs> thank you, Mike Lieber. Thanks, Mike. Thank, thank you very much. Celeste Jackson. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, Paul. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Yeah, we'll see everyone soon. Thanks so much.